let's uh, make a start today. Um, so I'll start off with just a couple of announcements following the uh, group mentor meetings yesterday. Um, from what I gathered, a lot of you were in a pretty good place in terms of uh, starting to identify your user or customer segment or maybe consumers and then starting to turn some of those into system level requirements. Um, what I did notice was that a few of the uh, groups were jumping a little bit further ahead and rather than focusing on the kind of really high level things, um, starting to develop initial high level concepts from those system requirements, were kind of diving straight into the subsystem elements. So I would just kind of urge you all to kind of step back a little bit, make sure that you're really nailing down who your customer, consumer, user might be, trying to express as clearly as possible the user needs and user requirements, and then building a really robust set of system requirements from those. Okay, that'll really help to kind of dictate your design, your concept development uh, from a good foundation. If you haven't set these already, then you'll start making uh, decisions maybe at subsystem level or maybe at the overall system level that aren't necessarily justified by that selection of your user and setting those requirements properly. Um, so by all means, go and do research, go and do kind of literature searching, read books about the different subsystem areas that are related to your work package. But at the moment, most of your activity should be at the group level, kind of all working together on those high level concepts and that initial kind of requirements um, kind of definition step. Okay? Uh, are there any questions following the mentor meetings yesterday? Generally? No? Um, there are two new bits up on the blackboard as well. So um, just to kind of give you a little bit more structure, there is a template for setting the requirements. Uh, that's in the course content folder. Um, so you can use that. Feel free to modify it if you see fit. Um, but it should have a reasonable structure there for you to work in. And I've also opened the Piazza Forum, uh, which is where you can start asking some of the more kind of technically driven uh, questions. And our team of GTAs and the mentors as well will answer those questions um, as you pose them. Okay. So um, if you still have questions about kind of the unit itself, uh, organizational element, feel free to email me, but if you have kind of more technical questions that potentially other groups or other people in the same position as you could benefit from, then feel free to pose them on the Piazza Forum. Equally, if you want to answer a question that pops up on the Piazza Forum, have a go. You might have seen something in your research in the kind of reading that you do that might be beneficial to the rest of the class as well. So. Uh, feel free to do that. We'll screen those answers to make sure that there's nothing kind of wildly wrong or inaccurate. But um, yeah, it's kind of joint communal learning here. Uh, today we're going to talk about systems modeling. And this is going to be uh, something that individually through the rest of the semester you're going to spend quite a lot of time doing. Okay, so from uh, maybe next week and the week after, you'll start to develop individual system models within your respective work package areas. And as a whole, as a group, you'll start to develop that integrated systems model led by your systems engineer. So hopefully the things I'm going to talk about today are going to be really, really useful uh, throughout the rest of the semester. Um, just to highlight a slight uh, change, mission analysis is going to be next week. Um, led by Kira McGrath, and then Peter Hollingsworth in week six will be leading the engineering decision-making methods lecture and workshop. Uh, so those have just switched around. Okay, in this session I'm going to work through some various different areas. So this unit is called Conceptual Aerospace Systems Design, but as of yet we haven't really defined what a system is. So I'm going to start off with that, and then hopefully by the end of that, you'll understand a little bit more what a, about what I mean by a system in this case. 
Uh, we're going to look at specifically what systems models are and why they're useful and what we're going to use them for. And then that'll lead on into uncertainty and sensitivity. And if you've looked at the syllabus and you recall the first couple of lectures, then you might remember that some of the learning outcomes and some of the things that I'm asking you to demonstrate in your individual and group reports are related to uncertainty and sensitivity analysis. So uh, using systems models, you'll be able to actually demonstrate some of these qualities. Um, we'll then look at specifically integrating systems models together to produce an overall systems model. And then we'll also touch on a little bit of dinathion optimization. Okay, so how you might use some of these systems models to drive towards maybe a better overall design for your system. So something that we might call optimal, whether that's locally or globally. Okay. Uh, I've shown a diagram a little bit similar to this in one of the earlier lectures. And we can think about a overall space system in a number of ways. And here, I've kind of represented that in a bit of a hierarchy, okay? So at the top, we have our overall system, and then I've broken it down into maybe a set of different elements that you might want to think about within that. Uh, so maybe the orbit and configuration are important, maybe the ground segment's important, maybe the launch and deployment is important. And then below that, for example, the space segment might be broken out into a payload, or it might be broken out into the platform side and the payload side together. And then we can look at various aspects of the operations. And this is a fairly simple representation of how we might break down that overall space system. But you know from the first couple of lectures and what you're working on now, we have to uh, kind of encompass definition of requirements, the objectives of your system while you're designing the thing, and maybe you want to try and work out how much value that can provide to your user, your customers, to a market segment, etc. You might also want to try and put together various different multidisciplinary analysis. So you can see here, in the payload section and the platform and the bus section, there may be many different disciplines that are working together to build that overall idea of what a spacecraft might look like. So you have to find some way of bringing this all together. Even within a single subsystem, you will have interactions between various different parameters or components and interdependencies. Okay, so we have to encompass all of that within our design. And then we have, might have a bunch of different stakeholders. So I've mentioned before, your users, your customers, your consumers, but there might also be regulatory stakeholders in this system as well. So you can quite easily see how a very simple hierarchical representation of this system in this kind of work breakdown structure gets quite complicated when you start to think about all of the other parts around your design, okay? Uh, product life cycle as well, um, another element there. Okay, so we can now start to think about what a system as a whole might be. Okay, I've put a NASA uh, definition up here, a construct or collection of different elements. Okay, so we're thinking about these different blocks maybe that together produce results not obtainable by the elements alone. Okay, so the sum of the parts and the whole, this is maybe a little bit of a clue as to what a system might be, right? The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. In COSI, okay, so a slightly different definition. Arrangements of parts of elements that together exhibit a behavior that the individual constituents do not. Okay, so think about subsystems contributing to an overall system. You can think about components building towards a subsystem. You can think about a system or number of systems building to a system of systems, okay? Um, and then you can extend that even further if you want. And if you want to take a little obtuse definition here, uh, whether you like him or not, uh, 
he builds systems that change the world at the moment. Okay, so he doesn't like thing, calling things systems apparently, but a dog is a system. Okay, uh, I was there in Adelaide. Uh, he's a very, very good speaker. Uh, it's worth watching. Wait, sir. Wait, so the Nkosi definition is an arrangement of parts or elements that together exhibit behavior or meaning that the individual constituents and constituents do not. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we can also consider them to be physical or conceptual or a combination of both, maybe digital. But we consider them to be composed of matter or energy or information and exhibit observable behavior. Okay? If we have a conceptual system, then maybe we can't actually observe that behavior in the physical world, but it may convey some type of meaning when we look at it in a digital sense. Okay? This gets a little bit maybe um, abstract here, but what I'm trying to generally convey here is that a system is almost anything. Okay? But essentially, what we get are a system comes from its parts. So if we look at the parts, we might be able to determine what the meaning of that overall system is. And we need to think about the relationships between those various different parts. So if we can capture those elements, then we can start to analyze or look at or investigate the system as a whole. Now, going a little bit further into a normal engineering system definition, we can represent a system in a number of different ways. I showed a work, down, uh, work breakdown structure before. This is a tool that I want each of the groups to develop eventually. And this is probably the most simple uh, kind of formation of that. And we call it a design structure matrix. And in this case, a static version of that. Or you also might see it in the literature as you search around on the internet as an N2 or N squared diagram. And essentially, in this case, we are looking at how the various different subsystems on the top and the side might interact with each other. Might, okay, so there, are, there is a potential for the interaction here. In actual fact, you could probably fill every single box here with a cross because it's very likely that every single subsystem is in some way going to interact a little bit with the other subsystem. In this case, it's essentially symmetrical. Okay, we're not actually thinking about whether it's a feed forward, feed backwards, exactly what information is maybe being transferred between the different subsystems, between the different analyses. We're just thinking about, is there a potential effect for one thing to have on another thing? Okay. And you can break this down in your groups just by talking to each other. Do a little bit of research on your, um, on your individual work package areas and then Say to someone else, are you affected by X, Y, or Z? Does it matter if I change the power um, of my system? Well, it, almost everyone will get affected by something like that. Okay? It might not be immediately obvious. We can then move on to thinking about a more dynamic definition for these things. Okay, so in this example, uh, and this is something that I put together uh, from my own research, uh, looking at a satellite constellation and how that might be deployed, we can now think about specific parameters or variables that are being transferred between different analyses, disciplines, or subsystems. Okay, so now you can see I've actually placed some arrows on the various different um, uh, nodes and links. And some of them feed forward, and some of them are feeding backwards. So if you're thinking about how to build 
a overall system and how information might link from one subsystem to the other, and you suddenly have a feed forward and a feedback loop, and that value could be changing every time you go around that loop, you can understand how sometimes the in integrated design of a system can get very, very complicated. Does that make sense? Right, so uh, in this case, we might choose altitude as our parameter of interest, and the altitude might change the size of your payload because you're looking at ground resolution. So the ground resolution will dictate maybe how big the telescope is. The telescope might be a critical factor in how big the spacecraft is. So as that altitude drops, the design of the payload might change, and that might have an effect on the elevation angle that that telescope can work at or some other parameter associated with the imaging on the ground. And that might mean that you want to reassess what orbit you actually operate in. Okay, so that feeds back into whoever's doing essentially the mission design in this case. And then everything might go in a loop again. So this will be a key challenge for the systems engineer in the group to coordinate how these various different exchanges of information are handled throughout your group. Okay? But it's also the responsibility of the individuals who are maybe controlling each of these core blocks to understand what their inputs are and what their outputs are and what effect they might have on the other people. If you can manage all of this digitally, and we'll talk about some of those tools later, then you might be able to automate this whole process. But a lot of the time that doesn't actually happen in reality. It gets a little bit messy. You might have non-convergence and you might have kind of runaway loops where you essentially end up in a design that is not feasible. Okay, so it usually has to be manipulated a little bit. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the definition of a system overall. Uh, now I'd like to get an idea of what you think a system model might be and what form it could take. Uh, so if I move this onto my other screen. Can you guys, just in the next minute or two, just throw a few ideas up there about what you think the definition of a systems model could be and what form it might take? So what might it look like or how might you make one? Okay, so I'll give you a couple of minutes and it should actually start throwing up some words on there. And we'll see what you think. Good stuff. I'm not sure that I am a systems model. I think I'm a system. Okay. There's some good answers in there. Okay, so I gave you a little bit of a clue here. It's something that takes an input and provides an output. Okay? something that fills this black box, essentially. Cool. So at its most basic, we have an abstraction or a simplification of an object or of a system. Okay? If you can do that, you've essentially created a systems model. 
uh, basically describing how a system works by providing an input to it and generating an output. Okay? So it could be really, really, really simple and just be a mathematical formula. Just describes the behavior, you have an input and you have an output. Uh, you could make it a little bit more complex, so you could have some type of graphical uh, interpretation of that. You could have a database, so it could be built from uh, a survey of existing things or things that you've observed. Uh, so it could be heuristic in the sense that it's not necessarily based on a fundamental formula, but something that you've put together from observations. Uh, you could build a systems model from a regression, so essentially a best fit line for a bunch of things, or machine learning, so you could apply something like a neural network to a set of data and still provide an input and get an output from it. That is an equally valid systems model, especially if you can then validate the output. And you can look at lots and lots of other essentially logical representations that provide some kind of quantitative outlook. Question? So a, in general, heuristics we think about as taking observed data and then trying to fit some type of distribution to it or some type of regression or um, it could be a database of uh, components and then you just fit uh, a uh, cost estimating relationship through them, something like that, okay? Uh, rather than being based on a, maybe a more fundamental uh, mathematical formula that describes the actual behavior, you're looking at maybe what's observed, okay? You could have physical systems models, uh, so you can do maybe a scale model of something and then provide an input and look at what the output is. And then you might also look at systems models for software by doing hardware in the loop and observing what happens there. And you can also do various different uh, simulations of these things too. So all of these tools that you have been learning about in various different units throughout the uh, program, all of these are forms of systems models. You're essentially representing some element of a larger system using a tool. Okay, I'm gonna run through an example for developing a systems model that's gonna be a lot more representative to what you should be doing during this unit. And we're gonna take the case of a propulsion system in this uh, example. Okay, so can anyone give me maybe the core components or one of the core components of a propulsion system. Sir? Yep. I can think of I can think of the main part that's made up of a bunch of smaller components, that being the motor. That be that being, you know what I mean, the motor. Motor? Yep. Yes. Fuel? Fuel? Okay. Yep. So we got uh, in my case I call it the thruster and propellant. But motor and fuel, fine. Anything else, maybe more specific to certain types of propulsion system? If it's not maybe a solid propulsion system, it's liquid or gas. Yep. A nozzle, yep. Okay. A tank. Okay. So these are some of the primary components, primary system elements that we can consider maybe if we want to build up a representation of a propulsion system. So in this case, I'm going to break it down into the thruster element, which is going to include the nozzle, the propellant, so the fuel, and a tank that's going to contain that fuel. Uh, for a more complex system, you might also want to look at multiple tanks, and you might want to look at also the pipe work between them and the control system that's going to enable that propulsion system to be used. But we can think about it and what you should be doing in your conceptual uh, kind of phase of the design, trying to break it down into essentially the fewest number of pieces that allow you to do uh, that feasibility 
um, to determine the feasibility of your system. Okay? So if you make it as simple as possible while still being able to demonstrate feasibility, that's brilliant. You're not working harder to get a more complicated answer, and I'll come on to uncertainty in a little bit that might be associated with that. Okay, what might the input to a propulsion system be? Um, if we're thinking about how to size it, or how to, um, yeah, maybe just set the scope of your propulsion system, what might you want to know? Yep? What orbit you're going to, okay, yeah? Or what orbit you're in, maybe. Yep? Delta V? Is there another hand up over here? Payload that you're carrying. Okay, so maybe something to do with the mass or the size of what you've got to move. Yep. Length of emission. Length, duration, okay. Yep. Direction. Yep. I would like to build up on this I would like to build up on this gentleman's example and suggest would we need to change the direction of our of our possibly motion. Yep. So, let's keep it really simple. Really, really simple. So, yes, all of these things might be inputs to a more complex model. But we might want to know the delta V. And we might also want to know how much thrust we need to produce. And the mass, okay? So, keeping it really, really simple. Just how much delta V you want over the lifetime of the mission, how much thrust you have to produce, so what magnitude, and then how much mass you need to move using that thrust. Okay, and then we're gonna output the system mass, so the propulsion system mass, the volume of propellant, and the amount of power that you might need to have on board to operate this propulsion system. So, here is a flowchart representation of a propulsion system model. Okay, we have, uh, let's go over here, the delta V budget and the required thrust as an input, and that comes from the mission analysis. And we have the spacecraft dry mass, which is going to come from the spacecraft mass budget. Okay, so we can already see that some of these parameters are coming from other people in the group and you might not have control. And also, there's feedback. So our overall propulsion system mass is going to feed back into the overall mass budget of the mission. Okay, so this is already forming maybe some type of iterative process. Okay, then we also have some various different calculations and things that we want to be able to calculate to produce these values. So we're going to look at something around thruster performance. We're going to look at something around the thruster design itself, the tank design. We're going to calculate how much mass that we need of the actual propellant that we're interested in using, and then finally get down to the propulsion system mass. This is where when you're building your systems model, you might need to start making some assumptions or start narrowing down on different subsystem options. So I've provided some inputs here. Uh, we've got a dry mass of 500 kilograms. We've got an orbit, so 500 kilometers, sun synchronous orbit, five year lifetime. We're gonna do some station keeping there. So we've calculated a delta V of 125 meters per second and a thrust required to do the various different maneuvers of 75 millinewtons. Okay, these have been provided by our mission analysis and they're gonna feed in to our propulsion system, subsystem uh, model here. We also have an assumed ISP. Okay, we've chosen to look in this case, a Hall effect thruster. Okay, and you can repeat this later if you wanted to look at an ion thruster or if you wanted to look at a cold gas thruster just by changing maybe the ISP value and making sure that you can produce the right amount of thrust. 
Okay? And the first thing that we're going to do is try and calculate the propellant mass that's required based on our dry mass and based on our ISP. So have I got any volunteers for a really, really simple relationship that might be able to connect these things together? I'm pretty sure you looked at it in Spacecraft Systems last year. Yes? I'm, I'm now just thinking of the, of the specific impulse multiplied by gravitational thing, gravitational field. Thing. Might be something to do with some of those parameters. We might not need the thrust just yet, but in terms of calculating how much propellant mass you need based on the dry mass of your spacecraft. Yep. Yep. So, keeping things super, super simple, we have a really nice equation that tells us, based on a delta V, and based on an ISP, and based on one of the masses that you want to use here, so it could be the wet mass, it could be the dry mass, you can calculate the other component. Okay? I hope everyone remembers this from spacecraft systems. Yep. Okay. So we can rearrange the form that I've got at the top to work out what our massive propellant is. And I'm not going to ask you to work it out because it's really, really simple. Um, so in this case, I've just plugged the numbers in, and we are going to use 4.3 kilograms of propellant to perform our mission. So we've completed that little part of the systems model. Now we can look at maybe the tanks that are required to store that volume of propellant. And in this case, remember that we're using a xenon Hall effect thruster. Okay, so we have xenon propellant under pressure in a tank. Do I have any volunteers for maybe how we go, around, uh, go about calculating the tank mass or volume required to store that propellant? Sir, mm -hmm. let's, find, let's find the amount of propellant for a single maneuver, for each, maneuver, for each type of maneuver that we need to do, and then multiply that by the number of maneuvers we You might, be, you might be thinking a little far ahead. So you might be overcomplicating your systems model already. We already have the total amount of propellant that you need for the entire mission. So you, all you need to do is design a tank for that total amount of propellant. Density. Density is part of it. Yep. Yep. OK. So we know that we're using xenon propellant. And we had the mass of that xenon propellant. So now we're going to think about how the volume of the tank might vary based on what the state of that propellant is and what the pressure that you want to store it at is. Okay, so we, again, we have a pretty simple relationship that describes that. Okay, so just think about, we're trying to work at the really fundamental levels here just to work out the feasibility and the general scale of things. OK. So I've provided, again, the numbers that you need here. And we can work out the volume of our propellant tank in this case, 0.0114 meters cubed. Okay, now you've got the mass of your propellant. You've got the mass of your, uh, so you've got the volume of your tank. The next step is to start calculating the actual mass of the tank to contain that volume of propellant. Okay, any ideas on that? Yep. Well, you need to make a material choice. Do you probably want to look at the heat stress in the tank because of the pressure of, mm -hmm. of the xenon? And then that would let you get a better idea with the temperature of what strength of material you need. Absolutely, so there's a material choice in there. There's probably also a geometric choice in there. So what shape of tank are you going to actually try and put your propellant in will affect how thick the material might need to be when you calculate out all of those stresses and strains. So um, 
for generic spacecraft generally, you might have seen spherical tanks, but you might also have seen kind of oblongated tanks or even toroidal tanks. Okay? Each one of those might have a different relationship between how thick the tank needs to be compared to the volume of propellant that's being stored. But again, we're going to keep it as simple as possible in this case. It's just an easy example. I want you guys to go away and maybe do the slightly more complicated versions of this. We're going to make the assumption that we're going to use a spherical tank, and we're going to try and work out what the wall thickness of that tank would be. Okay, so this is essentially going back to basic structures. Hopefully, you covered this in, uh, I think, second year. And we're going to base that on the maximum pressure that that propellant would be stored at. Okay? Again, Google, uh, your notes, various different sources will be able to provide you with these really, really fundamental equations for how we get from the required volume of a propellant at a certain pressure to the wall thickness that's required to contain that safely. Okay, so we've started to include a factor of safety in here, and we've included some parameters of the material, so density and yield stress. Okay, does everyone kind of see where I've gone here with this one? Yep. Yeah. So we're just taking as many of these kind of really, really easy wins as possible to build up an idea of our system. And then we get the overall tank mass, okay? 1.32 kilograms. Now we're going to think about the thruster design, okay? So we've kind of got to our tank mass. How much mass is our thruster going to take to produce maybe the thrust that we want? Or how much power is it going to consume? In this case, again, we're looking at Xenon Hall Effect thrusters. And I'm going to take a slightly different strategy in this case, because thruster design is a little bit more complex. We can't build a suitable systems model that covers maybe all of the different scales of thrusters from fundamental relationships. So in this case, I've decided to fit that data that I can find for all of the different Hall Effect thrusters on the market and get some relationships out of this. So essentially, fitting curves through existing data. And this is what I meant earlier when I talked about kind of heuristic relationships. This is essentially what we're doing here. So in our conceptual design phase, we don't want to tie ourselves down to a specific thruster design. We might want to have the ability to move our design point anywhere in a given range. Okay, if we pick one thruster, then we might be stuck with that choice and it might constrain our design later on. Maybe at PDR level or pre-CDR level, it would be appropriate to then think about exactly which thruster we want to use. But early in the conceptual design phase, you don't want to corner yourself to maybe a single model or a single component. Okay? What happens if it suddenly uh, gets discontinued by the manufacturer and there's nothing else to replace it? Okay? So in this case, essentially, I've turned all of these data points into a really, really simple systems model of y equals some uh, linear or nonlinear function of x. Okay? So I've connected the power and the thrust together and the thruster mass and the thrust together. These didn't magically just happen to be the only relationships. I actually traded off a bunch of different specs against each other to see which ones actually formed reasonable relationships. Okay? Because usually there's a driving factor behind which two parameters or maybe three parameters are associated with each other. And it's kind of natural in this case that for a Hall effect thruster, the amount of thrust it can pr produce at any given time is going to be related to the amount of power you're putting into it. There is some fundamental relationship there. And equally, the amount of thrust it can produce is maybe dependent on how big it is. 
So that's why there's a relationship with mass. Okay? So these are two useful, in this case, relationships that I found within all of that set of data to take forward into the design. Okay? You might find other ones. You might also be trading things off that are essentially correlated to multiple variables, but it's very hard to see. Okay? You can look at many, many more factors, and maybe it's not just between two variables, but then you extend that to three or four. That gets a little bit complex. Yep. So in this case, if you were trying to be super flexible in your systems model, you would only use the relationship. Because uh, this, for example, uh, y equals 15,222x plus 81.32 means that you can change the value of x and get a, an answer for y for that range. Okay. It's worth mentioning that this is only valid for the range that you can see here. If you picked a value out of that range, then you're basing it on data which you haven't seen or which isn't there. Okay? But if you only pick a single value, then again, you might be constraining yourself to a single um, amount of power or a single value of thrust. So if you can take the relationship through, then your design can change based on how much thrust you're told you're needed by your mission analysis. Okay, so then all you have to do is change one number and everything will propagate through and give you a new answer out at the end. Okay, when I talk about um, integrated systems modeling later, hopefully that will become a little clearer. Okay, so in this case, we're doing an example. So we are going to take a single value and we can get out a value of our thruster mass, which is going to be 4.36 kilograms. Okay? Hall effect thruster, about this big. Kind of makes sense. Okay, finally, we've got a mass of our thruster, we've got a tank mass, and we've got a propellant mass. We can essentially add those up to get our overall propulsion system mass, and we can plug that back into our spacecraft mass budget. Okay? This is the job of the systems engineer. He'll take that value away. It might be automated. Add it up to everything else and make sure that you can still build your system. Now you can see where the iteration might come in. So that value of dry mass has been updated by your systems engineer, maybe taking in other changes from your other colleagues. And you might then have to change the values of your calculation. Okay? So the propellant mass might change, the tank mass might change, your overall propulsion system mass might change. Feedback around the loop again. Okay. Pre computers, all of this would have essentially had to be done by hand. So you would produce a system spec, you would type it out maybe. Maybe it's just handwritten calculations. You would go hand it over to someone else in the design group. They would run their calculations based on your calculations. They would hand it over to someone else. And then chief engineer would have to sit there and bring everything together, work out if it was feasible or not, and then go and tell someone, actually, we can't do that. You need to change the numbers and go around the whole system again. Luckily, we can now do this in a much more automated process. And then we can start to integrate a whole system model together where you change a single input value and all of the calculations are done almost immediately. Maybe it runs some simulations in the background and gets an answer out for those. Feeds it all together and you can actually run maybe tens, hundreds, or thousands of different iterations without even thinking about it. Okay? And that opens up some really, really powerful possibilities in terms of design optimization, sensitivity analysis, and making sure that you produce an, opt an optimal design or maybe a robust design to your problem. Okay. 
So let's talk a little bit about integrated systems models. This is essentially linking together either systems models or subsystems models or component specifications, basically to build up into that larger system. And this is essentially where you need to get to at the end of the semester to prove that you have an overall idea of what your system is going to look like and whether it's going to be feasible when you bring all of the subsystem designs together. If you can think about how you're going to integrate your model together to begin with, then that'll smooth out that whole process of trying to connect everything together. If you've already defined inputs, if you've already defined, uh, defined outputs, uh, you've defined interfaces, you've made sure that maybe people are working in compatible uh, programming systems, or whether it's a single spreadsheet, all of these things will make your life a lot, lot easier than trying to bring together all of these systems models that people have de developed independently and smush them together to make an overall satellite design. Okay? So this is the bit that your chief engineer, your systems engineer, is going to be essentially orchestrating and pulling together. The other nice thing is that if everything is integrated together nicely, then you can have what we call a single point of truth. Okay? Everyone's essentially singing off the same hymn sheet, they're using the same input values, they're using each other's outputs, and you're not getting confused maybe between, oh, that's what I was working on last week. You haven't used the new values that I generated earlier today. If you can integrate everything nicely together, then you can make sure that everyone's working with the most up-to-date information. Um, loads and loads of different tools for doing this. Okay? The simplest one, and probably you'll be able to do 90% of the things in this unit, maybe even 100% of the things in this unit, you can do in Excel. Okay? A single spreadsheet, maybe everyone's got a different tab for their subsystem, just with cell references and some clever use of formula, you could probably build all of the system models that you need to for your spacecraft in Excel. Sir? Yes? Uh, that, I don't know. Uh, I, I would use a change log. I'm sure that with various different versions of GMAT, there is a change log published, and that'll tell you what's updated between different versions. But I wouldn't worry about that too much. I would just use whichever version of GMAT you have. Okay? Okay, so Excel. Sometimes it can get a bit difficult. If you've ever typed a really, really long formula into the Excel kind of tab, it can get kind of confusing with loads of different cell references. Sometimes you can't do iterative things very nicely. Okay, so that process where I mentioned, maybe you want to do a loop. Maybe your chief engineer wants to loop at various different times based on various different relationships. Excel might not be necessarily the best tool for every single systems model you want to produce. And if you want to then also interface with different simulation software and get values out, it might not be the easiest thing. You could still do your overall systems model in Excel, but you might have to provide some external inputs uh, to that. Uh, MATLAB, again, essentially complicated Excel with loads of extra functionality. Hopefully, you're getting more and more familiar with it. There's loads and loads of good stuff that you can do in MATLAB. It tends to be my preferred um, way of developing systems models in the first instance. Okay. There's some other online tools, so something called Valispace, which you can look at. And Valispace essentially provides a framework for integrating different mathematical formula and then also various different simulation packages together. Okay. Uh, it's starting to be adopted a little bit in industry now. So um, actually there are some ESA programs where they mandate the use of Valispace. It's quite interesting. Uh, and it's maybe five or six years old, so it's actually a relatively recent development in the industry. Okay? But 
certainly something worth looking at, even if you don't necessarily use it. Going a little bit more complex and probably too much for what you want to do in this unit, you can look at things like ANSYS Workbench, SysML, UML, and these larger frameworks for doing systems modeling and system design. And these are really extensible, where essentially you have modules which might port into simulation software, which might tie into Excel worksheets, which might be able to uh, perform MATLAB script processing and essentially would allow a full organization to be able to have different disciplines working in different software packages but still bringing that overall design together. Okay? Some of these things will work on uh, essentially time-based um, processing. So it might be that a simulation takes a week to run uh, think about CFD or um, FEA, and you might only want to press go on that every so often. You don't want it to update necessarily after every single design variable change from every other um, discipline. So these type of systems allow that functionality where you might have more control over when you perform certain disciplinary analyses and when you don't. Okay. But again, just something for you to be aware of as you kind of look at the various different options that might be used externally and in industry. So, what we're going to talk about now is an example that I put together for an integrated systems model in Excel. And I'm going to bring that up here. if I can get my, come on, okay, right, so I'm going to provide this uh, on the blackboard after the lecture session as well, okay, and in this case, we were designing a constellation of satellites that were going to be launched to one altitude would then change their altitude and try and separate using the J2 nodal drift effect, and then operate for a certain number of years, providing Earth observation data, which I connected with a very, very rough um, uh, cost estimating relationship. And then we wanted to see effectively what the profit of the system over that five years might be. And we were gonna vary two parameters in this. I'm going to vary the altitude at which the constellation was going to operate, and we were going to vary the number of spacecraft in that constellation. Okay? So you'll see here, this is essentially just a problem definition tab. I had a system input tab, so this might be just all of the global things that we're interested in. Uh, the things that we can change, the things that are constrained, and some outputs from the various different other tabs. And then we have all of the different disciplines that we're interested in contributing together to form an output. Okay? So I'll show you the output of this in a little while. Um, but this is essentially a whole systems model just in a spreadsheet. Didn't have to connect this to anything else. Um, you could have various different people working on this in different tabs, but everything is self-contained in this and produces an output. Okay, back to the presentation. So I'll come back to that as an example at the end. Okay, one of the things an integrated system model allows you to start doing is looking at sensitivity and uncertainty. Okay, so uncertainty might be something that you don't know uh, exactly. And that's pretty much everything that you're going to work with in engineering. It's very, uh, not very often that you have a single value which you know with very, very accurate precision 
and you don't have to account for any tolerance or any margin on that value. Okay, so in your designs, you should be always considering what the uncertainty on various inputs are and how sensitive your outputs might be to those, uh, that uncertainty on the input. So if we have a really well-developed systems model, we can look at that sensitivity. We can change the input parameter very slightly, or maybe it's a, quite a large amount because it's a super uncertain value, and see what the effect on our output is. That is the basis of a sensitivity analysis. Have you come across that in any of your other units or lectures yet? No? OK. Very, very, very useful concept. Okay. What it might also do is help you to understand the relationships between things that are maybe obscured by the type of formula or the fact that maybe it's a black box that you've got to operate with. So by changing the inputs and then looking at what the output uh, changes by, you can understand is there a big relationship change or is there only a very, very minor change? Maybe it's all the way down in a bunch of decimal points, changing the mass of your system by, I don't know, hundredth of a gram probably doesn't matter. But if suddenly you change something and you realize, oh, wow, my whole system has changed by a kilogram because I changed this one value by a small amount, then you know that that relationship is going to be quite important. Okay, so this can illuminate your understanding of those relationships in your system. What you need at the start is an estimation of how much something's going to change. Okay, so this could be, for example, the amount that temperatures in orbit are going to change. Um, what is the sensitivity of your system if your minimum temperature is minus 50 degrees or minus 60 degrees? Does that change the design of your thermal control system overall? Okay, so you need to have an assessment or an estimation of the range of magnitude of your inputs. Okay? What this will allow you to do on the outside, so when you've got your output, you can make sure that your design is going to be robust. Okay? If your assumptions are slightly wrong, but you've done a good sensitivity analysis and made sure that my assumed value has maybe a range of uncertainty around it, and you're operating in a slightly off-design configuration or off-design condition, then your design should still work and will still be operational, functional. Okay? So the external factors can change slightly, but your design will still be feasible. Okay? And that's what we describe as robustness. And that's one of the things that we'll be looking for in your designs towards the end of the semester is if you can demonstrate that your design is robust to these uncertainties. The other side of this is to think about design margins. Okay, so rather than thinking about what happens when a, uh, an input has an uncertainty around it, is can we encompass that change in the input by just accounting for something extra on the output? Can we just add some contingency or can we add some extra amount of kind of wiggle room so that your system will still be okay. Okay? So we tend to use this to account for unknown unknowns rather than uncertainty, which we would kind of class as a known unknown. Okay? We can kind of characterize it with a range, margins and contingency. We account for the things that we can't really express. Okay? You can use it to maybe also uh, encounter for technologies which haven't been properly designed yet. Okay, so in your case, you're designing something conceptually. If someone wanted to use your system and you haven't, or you've maybe provided them with a, a mass of 50 kilograms for your satellite and you want to put it on a launch vehicle, they might add a 50% margin thinking, well, it's only at the conceptual design stage, it's probably going to get heavier. Okay, that would be a good use of a margin because they can then make sure 
that the launch vehicle that you're going to launch on will have enough capacity even if your um, system mass grows considerably. The more mature a design gets, the smaller the margin usually gets. So at the early design stage, you might have 100% margin. At the end of the design phase, you might have, or maybe at conceptual, uh, sorry, um, uh, critical design review, you might then have 10% margins on your mass because everything's a little bit more certain. You've got more confidence in that design. There are guidelines out there for various subsystems. Uh, for example, ECSS, which is a European set, set of standardized guidelines for design that tell you about margins on various things. So um, maybe propellant margin on uh, delta V. So if you've only used um, kind of really basic maneuver equations to get a, de a delta V value for your mission, then they might suggest you use 100% margin on propellant, okay? Because it's probably quite uncertain. You haven't thought about detailed perturbation analysis. So just double the propellant that you've calculated for. If you've used some really uh, sophisticated software, you've thought about all of the different um, uncertainties, you've encompassed maybe the fact that there's off-design challenges around the use of your propulsion system, and you've validated some of that, then maybe you only need to add a 10% margin on your, propulsion, uh, your propellant mass. Okay? So those margins need to be commensurate with the amount or the kind of um, how far you are through your design and what confidence you have in your design. Okay. There's also contingency you can add, which is where you expect things to grow anyway. Okay. This is often in terms of cost, but mass is often you just add a contingency because you know it's probably going to get heavier. It's not always the best thing to have contingency because people then tend to design, oh, I, expect, I can use that contingency essentially in my design. Okay, so you need to be careful with this. And I kind of mentioned ECSS just, so uh, the example here, if you've got a, a system level masses, then if it's off the shelf, it's usually pretty well characterized. It's something you can go out and buy. You might only add 5%. Um, if it's something that's completely new, you might add 20%. <laughs> Always add 2% propellant because it's stuck in the bottom of the tank. You can't get it out. Okay? And then on delta V, yeah, you might have the difference between 5 and 100% depending on the type of analysis you've done. There are lots and lots of guidelines that you can go and look for that talk about this for different subsystems, different stages of design. Okay? These are things that are adopted widely in, in uh, industry. Okay, uh, we talked briefly about sensitivity analysis before. The easiest way to perform a sensitivity analysis is basically to change your inputs one at a time and see what happens at the output. Okay, so if you have one input and one output and you just change the input, you'll see what happens to your output. Okay? You'll understand how that input is connected to the output. You need a range of values, or maybe you have a probability distribution of your input. Then you can maybe provide a probability distribution of your output. Okay? This can get very, very complicated where you might have um, complex distributions, or you may not know what your um, how your input might change. Okay? You might have to go away and do some analysis of, okay, what are the temperatures on orbit before I can look at what the inputs might be. If you've got a really complicated systems model, you might not be able to run every single um, case. Okay? So if you've got a simulation that takes maybe even a minute, but maybe it's going to take a week or maybe it's going to take months if you're looking at some complicated CFD. You can't run that uh, simulation for every single case and particularly for every single combination of cases 
if you've got multiple inputs. So you might have to design a specific set of interesting or strategic cases that you want to run that will inform you in the best way possible about your output space. Okay, and we call this design of experiments. Uh, in this case, this is essentially just a grid. I'll show you this, how it works uh, in the spreadsheet in a little while, but this is essentially a two-dimensional case where we're changing two things and seeing how the output changes. Okay, and then we can color code it and look, okay, where's my best output? This is essentially a really coarse optimization at the same time. Uh, if we want to look at sensitivity measures, we can actually use quantif uh, quantified analysis for that. So we could look at partial derivatives, okay? How does the output variable change with the input variable? Or we could look at drawing some regressions through these and expressing them maybe in terms of um, formulae, okay? Then we can see, are there gradients that we might want to follow or move towards? Or does our design get better in one direction than another, okay? And essentially using graphical analysis techniques to express our sensitivity. But it doesn't allow us to explore the whole of the input space or interactions between inputs. Okay, we have to look at other more complex methods to do that. In a similar way, we can look at design optimization. Okay, so if we have the ability to pass an input and receive an output through our systems model, then depending on the complexity of that, we can optimize our output. If we know maybe we want to minimize mass and we're inputting some other value, then we can basically just search all of the input values for the minimum mass. Okay? Uh, you might also want to do a maximization function, so you might want to maximize the power output of a solar array, or you might want to maximize the efficiency of your propulsion system, for example. This gets really complicated when you start to have lots of different inputs. The more inputs you have and the more complex your systems model, if we look at it in a graphical sense, the more bumpy often your topology gets. Okay, if you're looking for the minimum value there, you might have to search lots and lots of points to figure out where that minimum value is. And unless you search all of the points, you don't have a guarantee that you have found the minimum value. You might have found a good value. It might be a really good value or it might be a good value in a certain area, but it might not be the minimum value, okay? In that case, we can't say it's the optimum solution. It might be locally optimum or it might just be good, but it's not in the whole design space gonna be the optimum value. Often, you can't optimize everything at the same time. So, for example, optimizing cost and mass simultaneously might be impossible. So, something that is more difficult to manufacture might achieve the minimum mass, but might cost you more. Okay, if you just think about machine processing, you can probably re uh, um, remove more material with a more complex process to make something lighter, but the longer that that machine is being used, the more it's gonna cost you, okay? So when we have conflicting objectives, and most of the time there are conflicting objectives, you can't minimize or optimize everything at the same time. This is where we have to th start thinking about which combination of objectives do we want to actually consider, okay? Is there a weighting maybe between mass and costs that we have to consider that gives us the overall best value or best utility of our system. Okay. This is where having a really good expression of your user needs might be really helpful. Ultimately, your user might not care that much about mass. It doesn't really matter how much it weighs, but they might be really interested in cost. Okay. 
this is worth looking into. Uh, there's something called the free uh, no free lunch theorem. Okay, and this goes into kind of economic theory, um, but essentially no optimization method or algorithm can be shown to be better across all of the different problems that are there to be solved. Okay, one method might be more suited to one type of problem, and another method might be suited to another type of problem. Okay, but you can't always apply one method to get the best solution. Okay, so you might have to try different ones, you might have to work out which is better for your problem. Okay. Um, there are lots and lots of different methods out there, and if you're working in MATLAB, there are toolboxes that will help you do these optimization problems. So there may, might be uh, gradient search problems where, for example, if you can build essentially a graphical output or start to maybe solve individual points on that mesh, then you essentially find the gradient between a couple of the points, and if you keep following that gradient down, you will find the minimum point eventually. You might have to solve a lot of cases to get there. That's gonna be pretty impossible in this case, because if you start solving your gradient and you get to the bottom of here, you're going to miss out on your minimum that's in the global sense over here. So in this case, you might want to use a completely different optimization method. So rather than using something that's derivative-based, you might want to search globally, and you might use some type of particle swarm optimization or genetic algorithm optimization method that looks over the whole space and maybe is able to pinpoint these global minima better. But it's quite often, even when you get around this vicinity with one of those methods, it can't find the bottom, okay? It's still working on maybe a random process, so it's not always going to find the very, uh, the most optimal solution, okay? So different methods for different problems, but they're not always going to um, necessarily produce the global optimum. Okay, um, I'm gonna go on to the example with the um, spreadsheet in a second and just run through that really quickly. Um, but at the end, essentially just some summaries and tips for systems modeling generally. Um, every single one of the, um, every single one of the different disciplines that you're working in every single one of the roles, you can build systems models and relationships for. Okay, for the systems engineer, that's gonna be predominantly the integrated systems model, okay, connecting all of the other subsystems together. And for all of the other disciplines, they will contribute to that. Okay, there's some really, really good examples that will be very, very useful for every single one of the systems in these textbooks, okay? And your systems engineering notes are gonna be really useful as well because you have actually developed some of these systems models already. Yep? Um, this is a bit more general, but for our subsystem, should we consider like redundancies and fail safes? And if so, do we work this into our system model? Yep, so a redundancy um, is essentially accounting for risk and essentially, you should just be able to system, uh, add that maybe as a factor in your systems model if you have, if you're, you could maybe build a systems model to account for risk. So what are the chances that something will fail? And then if you have two systems, then the chances of both of them failing will be much, much less. Okay, so you can actually account for that in systems modeling. Uh, what was the second thing? Uh, okay. But yeah, redundancy, definitely think about it in terms of whether it's worth doing because you might double the mass of your subsystem by having two versions of it. So if the risk is small, then it might not be worth it. If the risk is reasonably high, then it might be worth having that extra mass. Yep. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. We can have a five-minute break. 
Ah, yes. I need to actually release that. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, no, it's due on Friday. It's due on Friday. Today is Friday. <laughs> okay, I'll sort that out. Don't worry. Uh, it was only a practice one anyway. Okay, um, let me just finish this off. I'll give you five minutes, and then we'll run through the example. Um, so remember, systems models, ideally at the start, keep them really, really simple, and then build complexity in them as you need it. Don't go for the most complex version at the start. Uh, there will be lots of uncertainty, so embrace it, okay? Embrace that uncertainty, try and characterize the uncertainty, and then try and look at the sensitivity of your outputs against that uncertainty, okay? Don't just forget about it, because if you design yourself into a very, very specific um, point, then when you consider those off-design parameters, you might find out that your system is infeasible. Yep. Uh, for the design optimization case for subsystems, uh, I get how like you can make like different correlations and like use different graphs to like do mm -hmm. progression or like how different things are correlated. But how do we like do it at a macro scale? Like when we like integrate all those correlations mm -hmm. and subsystems. Like is there like a graph like software? Like I was uh, like how how can we talk about like, a graph like what's like the best one? So the graphing is maybe instructive in showing, illustrating optimization, but isn't necessary to show that you've actually done optimization. So at the global level, it might be impossible to create a graph because to create the graph, you actually have to have solved all of those points to build that kind of mesh, right? That's only useful for illustrating how optimization is working. Um, to actually do the optimization, you might only have to solve a certain number of cases, and then you can't really show it on a graph. Now, proving that you found the optimal position is almost impossible, right? To prove that you have found the optimal condition, you essentially have to solve all of the problems and then show that you have found either the minimum or the maximum. So if you've done the optimization, you might be able to show, well, we reduced the mass, like, iteratively. We solved the overall design problem using all of our systems models, and the mass went from here. It came down, it came down, it came down, but then it started to flat. Uh, the curve might have flattened, and we get to, essentially, a low point. Now, you don't know if that's globally the low point, but you can say we performed op optimization, and we achieved a, maybe a satisfactory mass. Okay? Um, it's worth remembering that when you're doing your requirements um, definition process, that basic systems models are really, really useful in generating some of these derived requirements that you need, and those performance requirements rather than functional requirements. Um, use sensitivity analysis to make sure that your design is robust against those uncertainties. And as ever, be consistent with your units, especially when you're working with your colleagues, if you're using uh, various different inputs and outputs, different softwares, different spreadsheets. It's really, really easy to get things wrong. Okay? Someone might be working in kilograms, someone might be working in grams. Okay? If you don't know that, then you've got maybe some interfaces to manage that, then things, it might just get lost in between the spreadsheets, something like that. Okay, so either be careful in terms of really defining interface as well, or just be consistent across all of your groups in terms of those units. Okay, um, if you want a five minute break, then I'll come back and do the uh, example spreadsheet. But I'm gonna put that on Blackboard anyway, um, and you can run through it in your own time if you want to. Okay. Okay, okay, so I mentioned a kind of systems model a little bit like this uh, earlier on. We've got some kind of feed forward. We've maybe got some feedback relationships, but I've identified a bunch of different relationships between the different um, modules. This was the problem that I was trying to solve um, in this example. 
Okay, so we actually set this as some coursework for a fourth year unit, so on the MSc and the MEng. Um, that unit doesn't exist anymore, but we're trying to resurrect it. Um, and basically, we wanted to, to be able to design a constellation of satellites to perform an EO task. It was going to be based in low Earth orbit, so that was constraining our problem. Uh, we constrained it further, or actually we removed a constraint because we said it was going to be infrared, so we don't mind if it's day or night, so we don't have to really consider eclipse conditions in this case. And the satellites were going to benefit from this cluster launch. So we were going to launch as many of the satellites together on a single launch vehicle, and then they would separate out on orbit into their respective constellation positions. And that was going to be based on a method called nodal regression. Okay? And what we wanted to do was determine the mission altitude. So the satellites might be launched to one altitude, but then they'll be raised or lowered to a different altitude where they will perform the mission, and to then maximize the system profit over a lifetime of five years. And I provided some very, very simple relationships here. So the total cost of the system is going to be the cost of the launch multiplied by the number of launches required, and the cost of the spacecraft by the number of spacecraft required. We're going to have a revenue, and that's going to be revenue during deployment, so whilst these satellites are separating out to their places, and then a revenue after they've been deployed when the system is fully operational, so they're actually providing more value at that point. And then we can define a really coarse profit based on the difference between the revenue and the cost. Okay? So very, very simple relationships. So then these were the parameters that we were thinking through. So the capability of the launcher, so how much payload can it actually launch, and how many satellites does that mean it can be launched based on their individual mass. Okay? And the fact that the launcher will change its capacity based on altitude. Okay? So the lower you want your injection to be, lower, um, so maybe from 500 kilometers down to 300 kilometers, you can launch more mass to a lower altitude than to a higher altitude. Okay? And I'll show you a figure of that from the manufacturer's specifications. In this case, I said that the launch orbit is going to be essentially predefined. So 450 kilometers at 51.6 degrees. Okay? So that's already defining some uh, parameters that we're going to use for the calculations later. Um, I narrowed it down to one launch vehicle, essentially constraining the problem, and this was going to be $65 million per launch. And I said something about the sensor that's going to be used. Okay, so it's got a two-degree cone, and again, I'll show a picture of that in a second. So the unknown things were what happens with the deployment of those satellites, how much delta V they require to perform that deployment, and then how much mass of propellant they need as well. Okay? And the overall size of the satellite is also going to change based on that mission orbit because the um, optical system will change in size as well. Okay, so again, really basic geometry informing systems model development basically defined how much area each satellite covers based on a, a circular footprint on the globe, based on that two-degree cone angle that I defined before. And then we know that our satellites are moving across the Earth at a certain rate, and that's based on your orbital velocity and your height. So you can work out your area coverage rate. And this is laid out in the SMAD book. Okay, one of the really easy ways of looking at how much land, essentially, a satellite covers over time. We can also look at the mass of the sensor based on what resolution it provides on the ground. Okay, so in this case, we had um, these values from the geometry. So we've got a lander, and we've got D, D being the diameter. Um, and then we've got our ground resolution distance. So that's basically the size of the pixel on the ground, so determining the kind of scale at which you can see things. 
And the mass of the instrument is then based on a formula that I provided. So you put the D in there, and you get the mass of the instrument. Okay, this is again something that I provided on the outset. Okay, I mentioned um, nodal precession before. So the satellite orbits, I don't, uh, you might have covered a little bit of this in spacecraft systems last year, but um, two orbits that have different altitude will drift apart in right ascension of the ascending node over time. Okay, and this allows you to do some really, really interesting things in terms of constellation deployment. Um, this is actually the area in which I did my PhD. Um, and basically, you can deploy a constellation that has different planes from a single launch vehicle if you give it enough time. And you only have to change the altitude. If you remember that changing inclination is really, really costly in terms of delta V, directly changing your right ascension of the ascending node is equally costly, okay? Because you're changing that orbit plane. So based on the fact that you essentially get a free plane change maneuver simply by changing the altitude, you can perform this type of constellation deployment very cheaply, but it'll take a long time, okay? If you try and do it at too low an altitude as well, then your spacecraft will start to decay potentially before you can achieve this. So there's some interesting trade-offs there. But essentially, it's all governed by this um, uh, equation at the top, which describes the variation in right ascension of the ascending node based on your semi-major axis, your eccentricity, your mean motion, which is essentially also related to your semi-major axis, and the inclination of your orbit. If you calculate this for two different semi-major axes or two different inclinations, subtract them from each other, you will get the relative drift rate between them. And then you can work out if you have a relative drift rate, essentially how long it will take them to separate by a certain uh, distance or a certain angle. So if you want two planes that are 30 degrees separated, then you can figure out how long it will take to do that. So for example, in this case, three months for that center and then six months for that um, far diagram. So again, simple equation-based systems model just to, to express how we can deploy that constellation. Um, the third element of this was then how we can look at the uh, actual in-plane change, so that altitude change to achieve that variation in semi-major axis that would, um, that would give you that nodal drift rate. So again, really, really simple rocket equation, and then working out the amount of propellant mass that you would need to do that, okay? And then based on um, the unmanned space vehicle cost model and the mass of the spacecraft, we can then work out how much each spacecraft was going to cost in terms of a financial value, okay? Really, really coarse. It's just an example of how we bring everything together in this case. Um, I said something about the launch vehicle before. If you go and look at all of the different manufacturers of launch vehicles, and SpaceX have their own version of this for Falcon 9, for example, um, you can see how for payload capability, so this is essentially the amount of kilograms you can launch, how that varies generally with altitude. So as I said, the higher your altitude, and it irritates me a little bit that they don't put altitude on the vertical axis because it makes it a lot more easy to understand. Um, you can see that as you get higher, your payload generally gets smaller. Okay? So you can use this to essentially find out for our, I set a requirement of 450 kilometers. Um, so that's down here, what our payload would be based on all of these different inclinations. So essentially, you draw the line up on the graph, and then you can find out how much mass this launch vehicle can deliver. OK. Now I'll go back to my example spreadsheet, because this is where the magic happens a little bit. So it's quite simple. If you've linked all of your different spreadsheets uh, all, all of your different calculations together, 
using cell referencing. And I remember from the field course, a lot of you didn't really embrace cell referencing. You like to do calculations on paper and then type values into the spreadsheet. Use cell referencing. It means that you can't get things wrong because they transfer the numbers directly. Okay? If you've connected everything together, and I've set up a tab which basically implements each of those simple system models and calculates the right things, then based on the original set of inputs, we can have two system variables that we're interested in, mission altitude and number of satellites. Okay? That's what I said at the start. We're going to change these two variables, and we want to know which provides the lowest cost or maybe the highest profit in this case. So everything's connected through to this page. So all I'm going to do is change one of these values and then see if this value changes. And hopefully, if everything's still working, it does. And that's based on, let's change it again, 15. Based on everything pulling through, all of the different spreadsheets doing the calculations. Now, I mentioned sensitivity analysis before. We have a different tab here where I'm then performing a sensitivity analysis in a really uh, kind of coarse or broad sense, where essentially I can look at all of the different um, altitudes that I'm interested in and all of the different number of satellites that I'm interested in and then can identify maybe the highest profit case and I've done that essentially by color coding and then finding the maximum value. Okay? And this is based on a tool called an Excel design table, um, which if you choose to kind of do everything in Excel, you can try and implement. It only works in two dimensions, though, which is a bit of a shame. So you can only have two different things um, that it'll actually find the, the minimum or maximum for. Um, so basically, this was just to show you that you can do almost all of the systems modeling you need to do, especially for the first few weeks of the semester, just in Excel, all working together in your different disciplines, and still integrate that together to get a good idea of what the overall mass might be or overall power budget might be for your satellite. Okay? After that, Systems models might need to get a little bit more complex. You might have iterative processes, and you might want to move some of the stuff to MATLAB. You might be able to connect that up to Excel if you want to. You might want to move everything into MATLAB. You might want to figure out a different way of integrating things together. But certainly at the start, Excel spreadsheets are the way to go. A lot of satellites have been designed with Excel spreadsheets as the primary kind of way of transferring information. It's really, really surprising how much power there is in just putting formula into different boxes and then adding them all together. Okay? I provide, I'm going to provide this on um, uh, Blackboard for you so you can have a play around. You can actually look at the, um, the ways in which I've implemented the various different systems models, um, compared them together, and then brought them together into that um, system input, and then output slide or output tab. Okay? Any questions at the end there?